Welcome to the Dongfang Hour Deep Dive episode. In this episode, we are going to talk about the Chinese space station cameras, as well as China's geostationary relay satellites. Now, you're probably wondering what is the link between the two? Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. Okay, did you notice the amazing footage that was released during the live stream of the Shenzhou 12 crew mission sending Taikonauts to the Chinese space station that took place a couple of weeks ago? Let me put a few extracts here just to refresh our memories. And nobly what you can see here is some amazing high-res footage of the Tianhe core module that's orbiting the Earth. This shows that China, and namely the Chinese Space Agency, as well as CASC, China's main space contractor, have been paying special attention to the cameras that are to equip the different modules of the Chinese space station. In a popular space media uh, in Chinese called Dianfeng Gaoti, nobly did a deep dive on this topic, and this gave me the idea for this episode. And so basically, the cameras on the Tianhe core module um, can be split into two categories. You have the commercial-grade cameras that are used inside the Tianhe core module, just inside the Chinese space station. And this is because basically the environment inside the space station isn't that different from uh, using these cameras on Earth, uh, apart from the weightlessness. So um, that is why commercial cameras can be used. Although we can see also on some images of inside the Chinese space station that the Chinese have put some calibration frames to study sort of the distortion that can happen when you use these cameras in space. But in general, probably not that big a difference. And then the second category is the cameras that you have on the outside of the Tianhe core module of the space station. And basically, these are very different cameras. These cameras have to withstand the very harsh, hostile environment of outer space, and that's not only extreme temperatures and also extreme uh, radiation from the sun. And basically, among these cameras that are on the outside, you have two categories of cameras. Uh, basically, you have uh, the ones that equip the robotic arm, and we've mentioned the robotic arm in past episodes of the Dongfang Hour. It's this arm that's used well for multiple purposes, but from a camera perspective, it's used to monitor spacecraft that are to dock with the Chinese space station or that are close to the Chinese space station. And also, it's used for maintenance purposes. There are cameras, notably. Uh, around the so-called wrist, elbow, and shoulder of this robotic arm to be able to see what is going on uh, on the outer side, the outer skin of the uh, Chinese space station. And then you have a second camera, uh, basically, which is the panoramic camera. And this camera uh, is able to take 360 degree images. And when you look carefully, it's actually composed of four cameras. You can see four camera lenses on this image. And so it's literally your Insta360 action camera that is, uh, that's on the outside of the Chinese space station. Okay, obviously it is much more robust. It is much more uh, space environment resistant. It's uh, probably much more powerful than the Insta360 action camera. Uh, although I'm not that sure about the better because when you look at the modern action cameras, such as the Insta360, these uh, devices are now able to produce 5.7K a resolution at 30 images per second. It's probably not something that cameras on a space station is able to do just due to the data downlinking limitations. Now, speaking of data downlink, um, we know that the Tianhe core module is able to download 1.2 gigabits per second of data. And that is really a lot of data. If you convert that into bytes, that's 150 megabytes per second. That's way more than my current internet connection. And this is approximately twice what the International Space Station is capable of doing currently with its upgraded downlinking system that was uh, I believe upgraded in 2019 and that is capable of supporting 600 megabits per second, not megabytes per second of, of data downlinking. And so this impressive performance of the Chinese space station is an example of what I call the latecomer's advantage. It's basically when you're sending your spacecraft into space much later than a competitor, you're able to include the latest technologies. And the gap is really evident when you're talking about technologies that have really managed to uh, leap ahead over the last uh, few years. So this is less true for some technologies that haven't changed that much, but this is really obvious when you're talking about some technologies such as camera chips, when you're talking about uh, some new generation antennas, when you're talking about solar array efficiency. These things are areas where you see that the Chinese space station has made a significant leap. 
And also, similarly to the ISS, which uh, communicates to the ground either directly or through a constellation of relay satellites called TDRS, the China's Tianhe core module, or just China's space station, does the same thing through a network of relay satellites called the Tianlian constellation of relay satellites. And the way communication through relay satellite works is that you have a number of, uh, you place a number of geostationary satellites uh, around the Earth, and the space station, instead of communicating directly with the ground, it communicates with the relay satellites that then conveys the data to the ground. And of course, this can work the other way around if you're doing data uplinks. And so why bother with such a solution? Because on paper, it does look a little complicated. And the idea is when your spacecraft is evolving in low Earth orbit, and that's the case for uh, the space stations at the moment, it means that you're moving at very high velocities at 7.6, or you know, basically between 7 and 8 meters per second. And at the altitude of low Earth orbit, th this means that you are able to complete an entire orbit around the Earth in around 90 to 100 to 110 minutes. And so that basically means that a ground station at a given area is able to communicate with the space station for about seven to eight-ish minutes before the space station leaves the line of sight of the ground station. And actually, these, these figures that I'm mentioning, seven to eight minutes of, uh, of communication, this is something that you can deduce with some high school math. I'll put a video up here on how you can actually find these figures if you're interested in finding them on your own. And so back to these seven, eight minutes of communication per ground station, that really isn't good at all, unless you're planning to uh, cover the entire planet with ground stations. Um, and generally, this is not possible considering that you have oceans covering most of the planet. And also, if you take a country like China, it doesn't necessarily have a very friendly relationships with all the countries around the world, meaning that these countries are not necessarily, um, you know, will not necessarily agree to have a Chinese ground station on their local land. And so this is where relay satellites play a very important role for the Chinese as well as for other countries such as the United States. And this is because the way relay satellites work, on the other hand, is that one relay satellite is able to cover approximately 160 degrees out of the 360 degrees revolution of a satellite in low Earth orbit. And th this means that strategically, if you place three geostationary satellites, you're able to have continuous communication with your satellite in low Earth orbit at all times. Now, this is probably overkill for a satellite that's doing remote sensing typically. So if the satellite isn't above a ground station, it's in a blind zone, that's fine. It keeps going forward in its orbit. And when it encounters a ground station, well, that's when it does the data downlink and it's no big deal, no harm done. However, if we're talking about crewed spacecraft, you really want to maintain a continuous communication with your crew that's in the spacecraft, right? That's pretty obvious. And that's one of the main reasons why China decided to launch a series of Tianlian relay satellites. And so it's been, it's launched so far four Tianlian 1 satellites between 2008 and 2016, uh, achieving global coverage. And actually the fourth Tianlian 1 satellite was a replacement to the very first Tianlian satellite that was reaching the end of its life expectancy. And since 2019, China has been deploying a second generation of relay satellites. It sent Tianlian, a first Tianlian 2 satellite in 2019, and it's about to send a second Tianlian 2 satellite in a couple of weeks. And so before these Tianlian satellites were set up, basically, so before 2008, crewed missions from China basically had to take into account uh, very significant zones, blind spots, where the crewed spaceflight could not communicate with the ground. And this was, for example, the case for uh, the very first crewed spaceflight of China with Taikonaut Yang Liwei in 2003. Communications were only sporadic. Uh, Yang Liwei and also uh, ground control had to accept you know, large regular communication blackouts as the spacecraft went out of bounds for uh, China's space stations. Now let's wrap up this episode by going back to the very early topic of Chinese space station cameras. NASA had a live streaming experiment between 2014 and 2019 called HDEV, which meant High Definition Earth Viewing Experiment. And basically this experiment was uh, with a camera that was sent specifically to the ISS for this purpose. And the idea was this camera would just acquire images and just live stream the video, the footage that it was getting down to Earth and live share it uh, directly on NASA's website. And so the article I was reading from Jin Feng Gaoti, the Chinese media, which, which is where I got the idea of this episode from, was uh, raising the question of, could we see a similar sort of experiment in China as well, live streaming images from the Chinese space station? And my personal opinion on this is, um, well, on the one hand, 
I don't think it's very likely considering how China has been reluctant and unpredictable regarding live streaming. And we've seen that, for example, with the Tianwen-1 mission, China generally prefers to continuously acquire images behind closed doors, but then on a regular basis, release some of the top images that were um, acquired during a given period. And yeah, basically that's China's historical practice. But then in recent years, and we've seen China have some very successful live streaming experiences. And this is typically the case for, there was a live streaming of the Shenzhou 12 crewed mission uh, launched on, on board a Long March 2F that was launched a couple of weeks ago. And there was also a live streaming of the Chinese uh, Tianhe core module that was sent into space by a Long March 5B. So, you know, there are reasons to hope that there will be live streaming. And, and if we look a little bit at what this uh, Dianfeng Gaudi media thinks, uh, basically, they think that it is very likely that China will have a live streaming camera experience um, once it's past the construction phase of the Chinese space station. So what this means is that um, China uh, this year and next year will still be in the construction phase. The Tianhe core module has been launched into space, but next year, China still has to launch the Wentian and the Mengting experimental modules. And when all of these are safely docked together, then we can expect, according to the media here, uh, to have some sort of live streaming experiment. And so at the earliest in 2023, but there are reasons to hope. So uh, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. This was the first experiment with a uh, Don't Fang Our Deep Dive. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a give us a thumbs up. And apart from that, I'm Jean Deville for the Don't Fang Hour. Thank you for watching.